Welcome to the Shift Gold Friday Gold Wrap, your overview of this week's precious metals news. It's Friday, December 4th. I'm your host, Mike Meharry. Thanks for tuning in. Well, we're finally starting to see some signs of life in the precious metal markets after a pretty dreadful November. Gold fell to a five-month low in November, dropping almost 6%. We saw gold fall through several significant key support levels, including 1900 an ounce, 1850 an ounce, and finally, we actually dropped below $1,800 an ounce, which, I'll be honest, that surprised me a little bit. But this week, we're finally starting to see a bit of a rebound. Yesterday marked the third straight day of gains for the yellow metal. Gold is back above $1,800 an ounce and is testing $1,850. It appears that maybe we're finally getting back to reality, at least for the moment. Now, I'm certainly not going to guarantee that this is going to last because the markets have been detached from reality for a long time. But ultimately, reality will always bite you in the butt no matter how much you try to ignore it. And what is the reality? Nothing has fundamentally changed. November was so strange to me because everybody was acting like the world had shifted. A lot of it rode on the back of the coronavirus vaccines. Hope of a vaccine created what I called market mania in the show last week. Everybody seems to assume that once we cure the Rona, everything is going to go back to normal. Nobody seems to remember that normal, as in the pre-pandemic economy, was teetering on the brink of collapse. That's the best we can hope for, getting back to teetering on the brink of collapse. And the reality is things are much worse now because the economic cure for coronavirus is making the economy sicker. Now, I'll grant you that a legitimate vaccine will open the door to some return to normalcy. People will ostensibly be able to start returning to a normal life. That means they'll be going back to work. Maybe we'll get to go to a movie. Maybe travel will rebound. The economy will have to pick up to some degree. So I think it's perfectly reasonable to expect an economic bounce once we get the coronavirus thing under control. It may even be a hefty economic bounce compared to the downturn that we've seen over the last several months. But that still doesn't make me terribly optimistic. We have an awful long way to come back from. The economy has contracted significantly. I mean, we had another 712,000 new unemployment claims this week. And that was good news, I guess, because it was less than the 787,000 claims the week before. You know, this was the first decrease in claims in three weeks. So everybody was in a good mood about that. But get this, weekly unemployment claims set a record back in March. Nine months later, and we have yet to fall below the previous record that was set during the Great Recession. But in the world of the new normal, I guess this is just a bit of ho-hum news. There were a couple of news items I ran across this week that give you a glimpse of just how much wreckage the government shutdowns have left in their wake. For one thing, people are struggling to pay their bills. 17 million households are behind on rent or mortgage payments, and nearly 6 million Americans say they are at risk for eviction over the next few months. On a previous show, I've talked about how devastating the government shutdowns have been for businesses. More than 420,000 small businesses have closed their doors permanently since the beginning of the pandemic. And this data is actually now about six weeks old, so I'm sure it's more than that. Brookings estimates that the U.S. economy has lost some 4 million jobs permanently in the small business sector. These jobs will only return with the creation of new businesses. On top of all of this, Goldman Sachs projects even more permanent job losses are coming down the pike as a wave of mergers and acquisitions and corporate takeovers sweep through the economy over the next year or so as these uh, companies try to adjust to the huge amounts of debt that they're dealing with. And 8 million Americans have slipped into poverty since the beginning of the pandemic. This study actually came out back in October, but it's making the rounds in the news again as Congress is starting to talk about stimulus. And that right there, 
That's the linchpin of all of this. Stimulus. Virtually every story I read about the problems in the economy mentions the need for more stimulus. You know, every time Jerome Powell or any of the other characters at the central bank come out and talk, they mention the need for more stimulus. If we can just borrow a little bit more money and hand it out, everything's going to be okay. Look, this is the problem, and this is why I say fundamentally nothing has changed and nothing is going to change. A vaccine doesn't undo this monetary policy. A vaccine doesn't erase all of the debt. A vaccine doesn't turn the money printing presses in the basement of the Eccles building off. Even if they cure COVID this afternoon, there is no vaccine for what ails the economy. In fact, the cure that they keep pushing and pushing is making the economy sicker and sicker. And this is why I thought the sell-off in gold last month was, quite frankly, nuts. You know, the risk-on attitude was so strong in November that the price of gold fell despite dollar weakness. Dollar weakness is usually good for gold because dollar weakness is telling us that the inflation monster is starting to wake from his slumber. And the dollar is going to get weaker because there is no way on God's green earth that they can end the policies that are making the dollar weak. We know that there is going to be more stimulus. We know that there is going to be more money printing. It's not a matter of if we get more stimulus. It's a matter of when and how much. Now, some people are going to tell me, Mike, there is no inflation. This isn't really a problem. I'm here to dispel that myth. The money supply, as measured by TMS, a metric created by economists Murray Rothbard and Joseph Salerno, grew by 37.08% year-on-year in October. Now, this was down just slightly from September's record growth rate of 37.54%. The staggering growth in the money supply becomes even more clear when you compare this year with last. TMS growth in October 2019 was a paltry, by comparison, 4.8%. The TMS set all-time records eight straight months leading into October. While the TMS metric fell just shy of its ninth straight record month in October, the M2 growth rate, so the more standard rate that we hear reported in the news, it did reach historic highs, growing by 24.17% in October. Now, historically, the growth in the money supply has never been higher, with the 1970s being the only period that even comes close. Now, you remember the 1970s, right? I mean, a lot of you might not, but uh, you know, I vaguely remember the 70s and the gas lines and the inflation and my parents worried about the cost of living. Uh, we're worse than that right now. This is, by definition, inflation, a growth in the money supply. Now, it may not have shown up in consumer prices, yet. Although every time my wife goes to the grocery store, she tells me how expensive things are getting. So maybe it is showing up in the prices. But it has certainly shown up in asset prices with the Dow cracking 30,000 in the midst of a massive economic downturn. Now, if I thought they were going to turn off the money spigot today, I would still think that all of this inflation is problematic because there's no way that they can withdraw the liquidity out of the economy, right? They tried to do this back in 2019, and the stock market started to crash, and the economy got shaky, and they turned right back to QE and rate cuts. Now, if they did try to normalize monetary policy today, interest rates would have to soar, and that would wreck an economy that is so levered up on trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of debt. So they aren't going to turn off the money spigot. It's going to keep running. In fact, it's probably going to have to run even faster in 2021 in order to keep up with the pace of government borrowing. I mentioned last week that the Fed now holds a record 16.5% of U.S. debt. Well, here's the dirty little secret. It's going to have to buy trillions of dollars in additional treasuries in 2021 just to keep up with the pace of government borrowing. In other words, there is no end in sight to quantitative easing. In fact, the central bank will have to double its scheduled monthly QE in 2021 to keep up with where it was in 2020. Let me say that again. In order to keep up with the amount of debt the Treasury is expected to issue in 2021, the Fed is going to have to double quantitative easing. I don't know what the number is when you double infinity, but here we are. Here are some of the numbers. 
In the last year, the Fed has added over $3 trillion to its balance sheet, most of that since March. That's roughly equal to the record $3.1 trillion budget deficit that the U.S. government ran in fiscal 2020. In other words, the Fed has monetized the equivalent of nearly all of the debt issued by Uncle Sam during the last fiscal year. In fiscal 2021, the Treasury Department is projecting a net issuance of $2.4 trillion in new debt, but the Fed is currently scheduled to monetize less than half of that total through its current QE program. That's approximately $960 billion. Now, even though this is an extraordinary amount of money printing and debt monetization, it doesn't come close to closing the gap, considering the Fed monetized virtually every dollar of net debt issuance in 2020. The open market simply can't absorb all of these treasury bonds. The Fed has to backstop the market or interest rates are going to shoot through the roof. And as I've already said, that is not feasible in a debt ridden economy. So what I'm getting at here is you are almost certainly going to see QE increase in the coming year. Double if these numbers are right. That means the money supply is going to continue to grow at an astonishing rate. Now, I'll be honest, I'm a bit surprised by the amount of inflation the economy has already been able to absorb, but economics always wins in the end. You can't print money indefinitely without consequences. But you know, that's the Fed's strategy. They're going to keep printing money in order to prop up the bond market so the government can keep borrowing. The central bank is trying to fight inflation with inflation. Yes, that is absolutely as insane as it sounds. The proper response to inflation is to rein it in, right? Let interest rates rise. Stop printing money. But the Fed's response is the exact opposite. Keep holding rates down with funny money. It's pouring jet fuel on a fire. And you know what's going to burn? The dollar. You think we're seeing dollar weakness now? Just wait until the Fed doubles QE. But, you know, I think a lot of people have been lulled into a false sense of security. The Fed got away with this in 2008. Actually, I think coronavirus kind of saved the Fed's bacon, at least temporarily. I've talked numerous times on the show about the fact that the monetary house of cards was already teetering before the pandemic. We were already seeing a return to QE before coronavirus. We saw interest rate cuts before coronavirus. That's because the Fed had realized it was impossible to normalize monetary policy that the cure for 2008 had to go on indefinitely. Coronavirus papered over that. It allowed the Fed to actually double down on the so-called cure and and kind of put things off into the future. But, you know, anyway, people seem to think that we can just keep printing money ad nauseum. So I expect more volatility in the gold and silver markets over the next few months because I still think a lot of people just don't get it. But eventually, reality will rear its ugly head. Reality always does. That's why we call it reality. If you are looking long term, with trillions of dollars of money created out of thin air still coming down the pipeline, I think you're going to want to have gold and silver. Now, if you want to learn more about the fundamentals of precious metals and how they can help preserve your wealth during inflationary times, and these are without a doubt inflationary times, I highly recommend talking to a shift gold precious metal specialist. You can call them at 1-888-GOLD-160. You can just shoot them an email at info at shiftgold.com. They'll get back to you. They can help explain how gold and silver can fit into your portfolio, into your personal investment strategy, and help you preserve your wealth during these crazy times. So that is a gold wrap for this week. You can get more details on all of these stories and more and keep up with the latest precious metals news and analysis throughout the week at shiftgold.com slash news. If you haven't done it yet, you can subscribe to the Friday Cold Wrap over at iTunes. We're on Stitcher. We're on Google Play. Uh, we are on the Shift Gold YouTube channel. You'll find links to this stuff all on our show notes page. As always, I do appreciate you taking time to listen to the show. I hope you have a great weekend, and I'll talk to you next week.